So welcome everyone to today's presentation on labyrinths. And before I introduce our speaker, <clears throat> I want to let you know that next month in November, we'll be hearing from our president of ACLS, George Hoselman. And he hasn't let me know what he's talking about exactly, but um, it should be good. He's a man that knows a lot, uh, many things, so it should be wonderful. Today's presenter is Lars Howlett. Beginning at Grace Cathedral, San Francisco in the early 1990s, the modern labyrinth revival has seeded the creation of over 2000 labyrinths in places of worship in the United States. Whether indoors or outdoors, big budget or homemade, permanent or canvas, labyrinths further the sense of the sacred and connect churches to the broader community. Mentored by the founders of the modern labyrinth revival, Lauren Artress and Robert Ferre, in 2015, Lars Disco launched Discover Labyrinths LLC and specializes in creating custom designs based on sacred geometry and visits to sacred sites around the world. Mentored by the founders of the modern labyrinth revival, uh, oh, I'm sorry. He's an advanced labyrinth facilitator, Veritas faculty member, and former chair of World Labyrinth Day. To learn more about his approach and see examples of his work, visit discoverlabyrinths.com. He also told me that he leads pilgrimages to different sites around the world where there are lots of labyrinths, many that are very old, and you can learn more about those at ver veriditas.org. That's V-E-R-I-D-I-T-A-S dot org. And they don't have information up just yet, but keep your eyes out for that. Is there um, an email list that you could sign up to learn about those, Lars? Uh, yeah. Um, I think yeah, through Veritas, you can sign up and hear about future events. And um, there are some upcoming events that are listed for the rest of this 2023, including a labyrinth facilitator training to learn how to introduce the labyrinth to community and lead group walks. And that's going to be with Lauren Archers and myself in about oh, two weeks, I think. And then there's workshops and webinars and classes, and then we'll release the pilgrimage dates for Chart, France, and uh, Gotland, Sweden uh, next year. So wonderful. So lots of resources. So without further ado, Lars. Well, thank you, Pam and Marilyn, and happy to be here with all you at the ACLS. And uh, um, Really excited to talk about my favorite thing next to my seven-year-old daughter, <laughs> which is labyrinths. And uh, I've done a lot of labyrinths for church communities. It's probably the number one client um, that I have. Um, as Pam said, I founded my own uh, LLC in, in 2015. So I've been doing this for eight years. And then I was an apprentice for three years to Robert Ferre, who was a master labyrinth builder. Um, and uh, I went back through in preparation for this talk, I went back through and looked at every project that I've done in a liturgical space. And so I put together a, a kind of slideshow about that. And then also, um, was uh, informed that you all had interest in the history of labyrinths and the um, design of them as well, because there's quite, you know, it seems like such a small little like thing, like a labyrinth is just like this little niche. But then when you get into the labyrinth, you realize there's kind of infinite possibilities, a wide ranging history and practice of using labyrinths. And it really becomes quite uh, <laughs> overwhelming when you start considering like, which design will we put in this space? So hopefully this webinar will help you uh, deepen your understanding of labyrinths and maybe, um, you know, consider ways to include the labyrinth in your work or your consulting um 
And I entitled this Labyrinth, Sacred Time, Sacred Space, because really that's what labyrinths create in my mind is uh, time by having a container. You step into a, a, a space and then also the pathway, which creates the journey through that space. Um, and uh, my mentor, Robert Frey, uh, often quoted Plato, and he said, but perhaps there is a pattern set up in the heavens for one who desires to see it and having seen it to find one in oneself. So um, labyrinths are a great match for liturgical spaces and probably um, the most well-known and beloved labyrinth in the world is the one in Chartres Cathedral uh, in France, um, which was built in 1200 AD and is still uh, surviving and walkable and in pretty good condition there. Um, this is an image of that labyrinth that I took last year. And um, firstly, people get confused between a labyrinth and a maze. And a maze has choices, you know, left or right or dead ends, you know, and it's really a puzzle that's meant to be solved and it's disorienting. But a labyrinth is a single meandering pathway that usually leads to the center. And instead of meant to you to lose your way, it's meant for you to find your way or find yourself. And people often set an intention uh, or ask a question before they enter, um, use it for a path of prayer or meditation. And it's a three-part journey, the journey in, the pausing in the center, and then the return back out again. Uh, labyrinths create time and space for personal, psychological, and spiritual transformation. They offer an embodied practice for connecting to yourself, your surroundings, and others. So, you know, labyrinths really are valuable in times of transition, whether it's individual transition, like you're retiring or you've lost a beloved person in your family or your community, or the community itself is going through a transition. Um, and some people call the labyrinth a sure path for uncertain times. And you can connect to yourself in the labyrinth. You can connect to the divine, to God, to the spirit. Uh, you can connect to your environment, the surroundings. And you can connect with other people if you're having a shared experience. Labyrinths evoke a sense of metaphor, the sacred, uh, religious practice, a spiritual journey, mindfulness, well-being, and community building. And because no one knows who or where or why the first labyrinth was created, I call them an open source archetype, which means that labyrinths can really be uh, open to your interpretation. And you can use it very devoutly and religiously and, and prayerfully, or you can use it, you know, for uh, stress reduction, or you could use it you know, for creativity or for dancing or for yoga. Um, and labyrinths go back uh, maybe four to 6,000 years. Um, and this is a labyrinth in Sweden uh, by a church. But what's interesting about this labyrinth is that perhaps the labyrinth is older than the church. And this is in a town called Froyel, which has the derivation of the word Freya, which is a Swedish goddess of fertility. And so this site was a sacred site for uh, worship of the feminine and labyrinths in some folklore are said to have been used for fertility rituals or celebration of the spring. And um, this is the simpler form of the labyrinth, which is the seven circuit classical labyrinth, or actually 11 circuit classical labyrinth. Here you can see the seven circuit classical labyrinth. And when I say circuit, I mean, when you're standing in the center, how many times does the pathway wrap around the center? So 
Uh, the easiest way to count is to actually stand in the center or look at the center and then count the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this would be a seven circuit classical labyrinth, which is the oldest form of the design. And perhaps this is the oldest example we have, which is a petroglyph in Galicia, Spain. And it's um, dated maybe to 2000 BC, but again, it's hard to date petroglyphs and um, we're uncertain about the age of this and also whether it's really the oldest, but you can see it's carved into a rock and it's about finger size. So maybe this labyrinth was traced with a finger or just used symbolically. Uh, Herman Kern is the kind of preeminent uh, historian of labyrinth designs and uh, he wrote a compendium of, of history of the labyrinth, which is no longer in print, but is still available in libraries and sometimes on eBay. And he wrote that labyrinths, he, this is how he defines archetypes, archetypal labyrinths. Uh, they're made anonymously in a sacred tradition, often unknown, and have been passed down and perfected through time. So, you know, how incredible to have this symbol that has this rich history, this tradition, but is still not, you know, based on a dogma, has no baggage. It's it's really uh, a symbol that is open uh, to interpretation. Um, and so this is the classical labyrinth in different forms. And you can see it was uh, kind of etched into a clay tablet in Greece. And this was found in a palace that burned down in 1200 BC in Pylos. And so this this actual labyrinth can be precisely dated to um, 1200 BC. So that is a 3,200 year old uh, labyrinth. And uh, so we know that it's at least that old. And then this is an Italian vase with a labyrinth on it. Uh, there were Cretan coins that had labyrinths um, on, the, on the backside of the, the coin. And then uh, we started seeing labyrinths kind of painted in uh, churches and manuscripts. And you can see this is a um, a classical labyrinth, and uh, it started being painted in red and then was completed in black. And if you want to have a little fun drawing your own labyrinth, we don't have time to do this. Unless you're watching the recording, you could pause the recording. But basically, you just draw a plus and then these four corners and four dots, and then you connect the lines and dots and you can draw the seven circuit classical labyrinth, um, which is perhaps how the labyrinth spread around the world. Uh, people taught the seed pattern to other people and the labyrinth spread um, to different cultures. And in India, there's this Mahabharata tale in the Hindu text about a military formation, and it's in the shape of a classical labyrinth with a spiral center. So it's a slightly adapted form of the classical labyrinth, but maybe this actually predates the um, Mediterranean labyrinths. Maybe labyrinths actually came from India. Uh, in the Native American Southwest, um, in the Tohono O'odham tribe, they uh, created a variation of the classical design uh, to represent their mythology. And uh, you can see uh, it's called the man in the maze, but that's pretty much a white, you know, archaeologist word for this design. Uh, they call it I Itoi. And, and uh, it's often used on jewelry or basketry um, and used as a symbolic uh, representation of the life journey. Uh, the next kind of major development in labyrinths was in Roman uh, period from 200 to 400, 200 BC to 400 CE. And you can see the labyrinth now is uh, more complex, divided into quadrants. Um, and these were done often in mosaic tiles, not walkable uh, perhaps, but uh, a little larger than a finger uh, width. And um, again, used as maybe a protective symbol. Uh, and you can see a minotaur there in the center of the, the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur and the labyrinth. Um, but it's, again, it's somewhat of a linear labyrinth where you walk this quadrant, then you walk this quadrant, then you complete this quadrant, the fourth quadrant, and then you come to the center. So it's it, this is somewhat of a predictable labyrinth path. But the first or the oldest church labyrinth 
um, that we are aware of is actually this Roman design from a church in Algeria in Northern Africa. So um, this is the beginning of kind of the uh, church labyrinth, at least the indoor church labyrinth, you know, depending on if you would call the um, pre-Christian labyrinths, you know, uh, spaces, sacred spaces, churches or not. Um, and then in medieval times, labyrinths were uh, drawn in manuscripts uh, and began to be replicated and uh, refined in church manuscripts. And then uh, in 1200, the Chart Labyrinth was inlaid in the floor of the cathedral. And this is a view looking down on it. And this is a full walkable labyrinth with a path width that is about your shoulders width distance apart. So it's actually 42 feet in diameter and the pathway is 13 and a half inches. Um, and for many, they feel like this is the most elegant and kind of uh, exemplary uh, ex uh, um, rendition of the labyrinth. And it's an 11 circuit, so uh, it's a longer journey as well. Um, then there was a period of midi of uh, turf labyrinths in, in England and the Baltic uh, Sea, labyrinths on grass, either where you are walking on a line between the grass or you are walking on a cut uh, turf um, labyrinth or in Sweden and in the Baltic, uh, northern Russia, you see just uh, field stones on the grass uh, to make a labyrinth. And you can see these are more organic, less refined, and kind of um, evolve, you know, with the with the people that walk them and the kind of get to be a little, uh, you know, mounded uh, with the many many people that have walked through them. Um, then labyrinth design began to be divided into more um, segments. So instead of quadrants, now you see these sectors where the labyrinth is divided into five sectors or many sectors, maybe seven sectors. And then this is a contemporary labyrinth with three sectors that is actually used for godly play. So this is a canvas labyrinth that's used in church for children to walk because it has a shorter path, shorter journey uh, to the center um, and can be just laid out in a small room for Sunday school. And now we are in the kind of contemporary labyrinth uh, era, and there's um, thousands of designs that are being created and uh, all different ways of, of uh, rethinking how labyrinths should be. Some labyrinths with multiple centers, some labyrinths with um, ongoing, you can kind of walk them infinite loop, some labyrinths with crossover pathways even, or um, uh, different uh, like this, uh, flower in the seed labyrinth that a friend of mine made for a church for Easter, kind of uh, you walk through and then you actually walk out the other side. So it's a one-way labyrinth instead of uh, a labyrinth that you retrace your steps back out the center. Um, so those are kind of the major uh, periods of labyrinth development and labyrinths kind of fall in and out of consciousness during uh during history every 500 years there seems to be another revival of labyrinths and now we are in kind of the modern revival of labyrinths and that was really started in the united states by lauren Artris at grace cathedral in san francisco in 1991 she was in the midst of the aids crisis and she was a canon pastor to the congregation there and um she was trying to find some way for the congregation and community to grieve the losses uh, during the AIDS ep epidemic. And so she went to Chart Cathedral and uh, decided to create a canvas labyrinth. And um, they would have canvas labyrinth walks twice a month in the cathedral. And then she also took the canvas on the airplane and took it around from church to church on the weekends. Uh, and as people found out about the labyrinth, she kept getting invitations to the point where she was almost going every week to a different church, bringing the canvas labyrinth and giving people the opportunity to walk it and learn about it. 
Then they created a carpet labyrinth uh, that could be available all the time at the cathedral. And it was a hand-woven tapestry in the shape of the chart design. And then they created an outdoor permanent labyrinth. So the labyrinth could be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then eventually they created a permanent indoor labyrinth. So now there are two uh, stone labyrinths at Grace Cathedral. And if the cathedral is closed or there is a mass or service, you can walk the labyrinth outdoors. Um, whereas if you go to Chartres, France, the labyrinth is only open on Fridays. Otherwise, it is covered in chairs. And uh, and so many people have been to Chartres, but actually don't see the labyrinth because it is uh, covered up most of the time. Um, Lauren Artris wrote the book Walking a Sacred Path uh, in 1995. And uh, for many, that's how they uh, found out about the labyrinth. She also founded Veritas, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to um, facilitating labyrinths and pilgrimage. And um, then Veritas teamed up with the Labyrinth Society, which is another nonprofit, and launched the Labyrinth Locator in 2004. And the Labyrinth Locator is an, uh, a database online where you can search for labyrinths in your location. So one of the best ways to learn about the labyrinth is actually to search the locator and go out and walk one for yourself. And uh, there's over 6,000 listings, and 2,400 of them are in churches and places of worship. So uh, I think because of the work of Lauren Artris and the Labyrinths at Grace Cathedral, uh, most people um, are familiar with this medieval uh, labyrinth. And then also, um, because Grace is an Episcopalian church, I think a lot of the Episcopalian churches are the ones that really began um, the, the kind of modern revival. Um, to me, why are labyrinths coming back into consciousness is because people have lost a sense of the sacred. And I think um, it's interesting, if you look at Google, the definition of sacred, you can actually uh, read it, but you can also see how often uh, the word sacred is used in literature from 1800 to present. And Google has been scanning millions and millions of books. And this is a graph of the prevalence of the word sacred with the lowercase s in literature. And you can see it really um, goes down from 1800 to you know the 1940s to the 1980s was kind of the lowest. And then uh, is kind of just slowly coming back up again. And um, I was looking today also at church attendance um, has decreased, you know, I think we're all aware of this, but uh, since the 1950s, um, you know, the number of people that have attended church in the last seven days is down to 31% of the population. And the number of people that are members of a church has decreased from 70% to 40% of the population uh, since the 1950s. So. Um, why are labyrinths coming back into consciousness and why are churches building them? Well, I think it is to offer a alternative or an expanded um, sacred space. And um, it can be indoors, it can be outdoors, it can be simple, it can be complex or refined. Um, Joseph Campbell says, your sacred space is where you can find yourself over and over again. And uh, for some people, going through the doors of the church is difficult. But if the labyrinth is outdoors, um, they feel a little more comfortable, if they're not a member of the church, to go onto the grounds and to connect with the spirit or the divine or to pray. Um, and labyrinths create sacred time, which Christine Walters Paintner says is devoted to the heart, to things that matter, to wonder and beauty, and to catching glimpses of eternity. So I think traditionally a lot of people devoted sacred time to one day a week, right? It was the Sabbath. It was maybe Sunday or um, Shabbat on Friday evening. And um, now it's so busy, we're so connected that we, 
it's harder to set apart that sacred time. And people find it at different moments in the day or the week. And um, labyrinths are kind of an opportunity to find that connection to sacred time and sacred space, um, not necessarily on Sunday morning at 8 a.m. You know, you can find it when you need it. And uh, whether that's during a time of crisis in your life or just, you know, in the week when you have an afternoon free and you want to go connect to yourself and kind of step outside the schedule. So how do we create labyrinths? Um, labyrinths really are created through sacred geometry. And I'm sure many of you being consultants to liturgical spaces often think about how do you create sacred space? And maybe you incorporate sacred geometry into your work. And my mentor, um, Robert Ferre, these are his four assumptions of sacred geometry. Number one, a divine hand and mind created the universe. Number two, the creation was lawful according to number and proportion. Three, we can discover these laws by looking at nature. And once we know these laws, we can use them to create like God creates. And so labyrinths, this is my, this is Robert in the center of a um, chart labyrinth uh, that we were creating uh, out of um, masking tape, a template that we would color in with a crushed granite overlay. And he's drawing the center rosette of the chart labyrinth. And basically the idea of the sacred geometry is that these proportions and um, numbers and patterns that are in nature are reflected in the labyrinth and that creates a sense of balance, divine, of cosmic order, you know, that just like a cathedral is created, you know, reflecting the beauty of God's plan, the labyrinth itself reflects kind of a divine imprint on, on the earth. Uh, labyrinths create sacred space and time because they have a defined perimeter that denotes a separate precinct. So usually the labyrinth uh, is set aside as a sacred space either within the church or outside of the church. And there is a threshold that creates a gateway to enter this domain. So it's a sacred space that you are invited to step into and walk around in. Um, and that's with the pathway that creates the journey uh, to the center. And labyrinths are created with intention, consecrated or blessed through ritual or ceremony. And so it's not just, you know, a construction worker putting a labyrinth on the ground. I think you really want to incorporate ritual and ceremony and, you know, intention into the spirit of the labyrinth itself um, to infuse it with that energy and that intention. Um, labyrinths are used for spiritual, religious, or personal reflection. They are based on this ancient archetype that has symbolic meaning. And they reflect sacred geometry and design, value, and proportion. And they are meant to be respected or free from disruption or mindless activity. And it's a fine line here because you want the labyrinth to be open to people to use in whatever way they want. But it often is necessary to say that this is a sacred space that, you know, we, we don't want bicycles or skateboarding or, you know, other things um, to desecrate the, the space. Um, labyrinths can be temporary or permanent. Uh, we were at the Veritas, was at the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago this past summer, and uh, there were over 6,000 attendees of different faiths. And this is a temporary labyrinth that I created with uh, masking tape on a plaza. And so, you know, to introduce a labyrinth to a community that's not uh, used to labyrinths, you could lay out a temporary labyrinth. And this is also a good way to kind of test drive the labyrinth and see if the size or the design or the proportions uh, work in the space. Um, you can also purchase a canvas labyrinth from Veritas. And canvas labyrinths are also a great way to introduce the labyrinth to community 
to gain support for the labyrinth. If you are fundraising uh, to create a permanent labyrinth, then the the Canvas Labyrinth can be used to um, generate awareness and, and support for the project. And this is a permanent outdoor labyrinth at Trinity Episcopal Church in Ashland, Oregon. And I just um, restored this labyrinth that my mentor created 20 years ago. Uh, we recolored the design using a different material, uh, a crushed quartz crystal overlay that is uh, fade proof and more durable. And uh, you can see this is a, a, a sharp replica, and it's in a beautiful um, setting because not only are you creating the labyrinth itself, but if uh, you know you're creating a landscape and a container for it, and you can see that here there's plantings and hedges and ginkgo trees, and there's a waterfall fountain in the at the um, orientation at the top center of the labyrinth, and benches and lights and all things you can add to uh, expand the experience and container for the space. So now we'll look at a few labyrinths that I created um, in different uh, churches. Uh, sometimes labyrinths are built from scratch and sometimes the labyrinth is just put into an existing space. So here at St. John Vianney Catholic Church in Walnut Creek, you can see they had a, a concrete patio um, and it was just empty. So this was a space that they decided to create the labyrinth in an existing concrete courtyard. And this is the finished labyrinth uh, with the same crushed granite overlay on concrete. Um, and it came out really well. It filled the space perfectly and uh, it's oriented to this uh, statue and to the cross above. Here you can see the process for creating the crushed granite uh, labyrinth on concrete. And this is one of my favorite methods for a permanent labyrinth because it creates an accessible labyrinth that could be used by wheelchairs um, or walkers. Um, and it can be created to any size. Uh, so this labyrinth is a five circuit variation, a smaller um, version of the Chart labyrinth. Instead of the 11 circuits, it's about half size. It's five circuits and it's got a smaller center. Um, and you can see we just kind of fit it into a brand new concrete courtyard that was poured there. Uh, this is a seven circuit variation, so kind of a medium sized labyrinth. This one is, I think, maybe 32 feet in diameter. And um, it is uh, inside painted on the wood floor. Um, when it was refinished, the wood was sanded and refinished. The labyrinth was drawn and painted on the floor and then covered in a varnish to protect it. And you can see how it transforms the space uh, from just like a kind of meeting hall um, and uh, cafeteria room to a uh, sacred space used for walks, uh, but still multi-purpose. So they do put the tables back over this and have uh, regular dinners and receptions there on top of the labyrinth. And this is at a synagogue in uh, Northbrook, Illinois, outside of Chicago. And so this is a labyrinth that created for a, um, a rabbi, and it's a, a variation of the medieval design, but it's actually not a chart uh, sequence. It's a, it's a contemporary sequence that has a different um, form. And then the center is a seed of life uh, pattern instead of the rosette pattern. And... Uh, on the center of their um, arc here, where this uh, tree of life is engraved on the um, doorways, uh, the seed of life and the tree of life kind of uh, interact and reflect one another. And this is on uh, water jet cut vinyl tiles uh, for an indoor space. Here's a more playful multicolor labyrinth that is painted onto a courtyard outside of a church in San Leandro. This is a Methodist church. So now you can see there's different um, faith traditions using different labyrinths, uh, different designs. We've seen Episcopal, we've seen um, Catholic, we've seen Jewish, and now we're seeing Methodist. Um, here's another Episcopal church in, San Le uh, in Mission Viejo, California. Uh, with bricks inlaid in decomposed granite. So a whole nother process of inlaying uh, brick or stone into uh, DG um, in a uh, space next to their parking lot. 
And it's great to work with the congregation in creating labyrinths. So here you can see volunteers from the community um, filling in the decomposed granite. And uh, this is a great way to involve the, the members in the creation of sacred space. And it helps them feel a part of it and that the, the sacred space is theirs. And uh, members of the congregation who are unable to work you know, on their hands and knees could write prayers into pieces of paper that then the minister himself is burying into the labyrinth. And um, this is the finished labyrinth uh, in Modesto, California. And you can see the orientation of the labyrinth is something really important to consider, which is where's the entrance of the labyrinth and where does it face? And the orientation here is to the street so that the community can walk right off the sidewalk down the pathway and into the labyrinth. You know, if they really wanted this this labyrinth just to be for the church, they could have had it enter from the church, but they have it entering from the street to create a bridge between the community and the church. And what they used to have here was a lawn. So they actually removed their lawn to save money and they got a grant from their uh, local municipality to remove the grass and uh, put in a labyrinth. And so labyrinths are a great alternative to just grass lawns in front of uh, churches. Uh, this is at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Petaluma, California. And these are um, custom cut bluestone in decomposed granite. And here members of the congregation wrote prayers and blessings on the back of the stones and then set the stones around the labyrinth to create the perimeter lunations and um, just uh, were involved in that final kind of aspect of it. Um, this is a labyrinth at St. Luke's in Woodland, California. And you can see this is a labyrinth where the stones are inlaid into grass and uh, you walk on the grass. And um, this is an easier labyrinth to maintain just by mowing across. And then you have to edge it maybe once a year to keep the grass from encroaching over the bricks. Um, here's the opposite. This is a labyrinth with inlaid stone pathway and a grass uh, border. And here you walk on the stone itself. And this is at a uh, synagogue in North Adams, Massachusetts. And this is the Seventh Circuit classical design. So um, it's important when you're consulting for people about a labyrinth in a different uh, congregation that you make them aware of all the variety of labyrinth designs, um, such as uh, you know, at this uh, synagogue, they chose the Seven Circuit Classical Labyrinth because it predates the, the Christian use of the labyrinth. And here is a Baltic wheel design, which has actually become the most popular design in the last year of labyrinths that I've built at St. John's Episcopal Church in Oakland, California. We use this um, Baltic wheel design, which is a classical labyrinth that looks kind of like a tree when seen from above. And it's a processional labyrinth, meaning it's a one-way labyrinth that can be walked into the center and then out the other side. So you can kind of decide, do you retrace your steps again, or do you make it just a one-way path, which also makes it kind of a simpler journey and more accessible to people that can't walk as far. So opportunities. So what opportunities are there for labyrinths in churches and um, liturgical spaces? Well, they can kind of become a second sanctuary, especially during the pandemic. Uh, many churches actually had their mass on the labyrinth outdoors, so it's a safer space for, for times of, of sickness. And uh, also during the pandemic, when churches were closed, a lot of um, people visited the labyrinths at their church uh, on their own time and were able to maintain a connection with the church and with their um religion, even though they were practicing on their own. Um, the labyrinth can become a bridge to the community, as some people feel more comfortable being outdoors or walking the labyrinth. And then as they, you know, begin returning to the labyrinth, there's the chance that maybe then one day they will become a member of the community. So it kind of expands the, um, the possibilities. It creates another entryway into the church. Um, they can be used for centering prayer or meditation, uh, social justice or activism. So you can have like a food drive where you ask people to bring in, 
canned goods and place them on the labyrinth. And then over the course of the day, the labyrinth can be defined by the canned goods. Or you could have a clothing drive where people bring um, coats or things and bring them to the labyrinth. And instead of just tossing them into a bin, they can actually walk through the labyrinth and kind of uh, experience the, you know, the donation in a different way. Uh, you can use them for vigils or crisis response. You know, if something difficult happens in the community and the world, you can have a labyrinth walk uh, to pray or hold a vigil. Um, people use them for uh, Easter or Lent, Stations of the Cross or Advent. Um, different times of the year, the labyrinth can be uh, woven into um, the rituals of the church. Um, they can be used for weddings or memorials, retirements, um, rites of passage. Um, for youth. And uh, really, the labyrinth is a space that can be all the way from children to seniors. Um, you know, it's a space that's really attractive to all levels of, of the community and congregation. And then you can have other contemplative practices like yoga or qigong or uh, drum circle or uh, dancing, storytelling. Uh, you know, you could do other things on the labyrinth besides walking it as well. So how to walk a labyrinth. Um, this is just a thumbnail sketch, and uh, I realize we're getting close on time, so I'll try to save a, a couple minutes for questions and answers. But the four R's are a framework that you can use where you release on the way in, you receive in the center, you return on the journey back out, and then you remember what your insights or experience was and take that um, with you. Um, you can walk them by yourself. You can walk them in a group, indoors, outdoors. Um, I think we've talked a lot about this, but there's just many different ways to use the labyrinth, especially for grief and loss, I think is one of the one of the powerful opportunities to use a labyrinth and coming out of the pandemic itself, I feel a lot of us are still using the labyrinth as a way to process what we've been through collectively. Um, and this, I have a whole nother webinar about this, but how to keep a labyrinth alive. And these are kind of the essential elements to maintaining the labyrinth in your community, awareness, stewardship, recurring events, placemaking, and maintenance. So really thinking about the labyrinth as a living thing, right? The labyrinth is not just a, you know, you put it in and it does its work. You know, you have to, you have to feed the labyrinth, you have to energize the labyrinth, you have to keep the labyrinth alive for your community. And there are lonely labyrinths out there. There might be a labyrinth at the church or in the community that's not being used and has lost its um <laughs> identity. And so then really you have to think about how you can reawaken that labyrinth for the people that uh, are there. So uh, here's a couple of websites if you want to learn more. Um, my website is discoverlabyrinths.com and I do design, building, and consultation on labyrinths. Um, Veritas.org is where we have the facilitator trainings, workshops, and pilgrimage, and I'm a faculty and part-time staff member of Veritas. Uh, we have some pre-recorded classes and webinars. Uh, if you want to learn how to draw or design labyrinths, I have a full course on drawing them at veritas.teachable.com. And then I really encourage you to go on the labyrinth locator um, because I could talk about labyrinths all day, but I really feel like the most valuable thing you can do is go out and find a labyrinth for yourself and walk it and uh, experience it for for yourself and, and see what it is to you. So thank you. I appreciate your time. And if there's any questions, I feel free to either raise your virtual hand or your physical hand. And uh, I guess we have about maybe 10 or 12 minutes for questions and answers. Thank you so much, Lars. I know that I'm, uh, I have been thinking about putting one in my backyard and now I'm re-inspired to think about that and how that might be done. Um, if yeah. you have any thoughts about doing it at home, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, well, the easiest labyrinth to build is the 
classical labyrinth. And so it has the fewest turns and the least amount of geometry. Um, and you can build it from the seed pattern, which is how I first started drawing and building labyrinths was just drawing them on the beach in the sand and then um, drawing the seed pattern on the ground and laying out the stones. So um, that's probably the simplest way um, to create a labyrinth. And you don't have to use math. So uh, geometry doesn't really have to involve numbers. It's more about proportion. It's more about like you could pick a stick up off the ground and you could have the stick be your path width and you could just lay out your whole labyrinth with the stick and then like a compass, you know, you need a center point and you create your circles, but you really just need a straight edge and a compass. You don't have to worry about any of the numbers. And when um, the Chartres Labyrinth was built in 1200, uh, they were still using Roman numerals. It's just incredible to think that that entire cathedral was built uh, at a time when they were using Roman numerals. <laughs> so, yeah. Fascinating. Are there questions? Go okay. ahead, Sarah. Sarah? Hi, uh, I recently did a labyrinth walk at Frederick Community College in Maryland, and uh, it was used, it, it, the labyrinth there was built using your technique, so I'm not sure if you were involved in that or not. Uh, yes. Oh, where did you do that one? Anyhow, it's beautiful, And but we were doing a professional development weekend there, mm -hmm. and it was amazing how this tiny cohort, there was maybe eight people who did this workshop, and everyone was in tears at the end. And wow. it was such a powerful thing to create this sense of uh, group cohesion that we did this thing together and we did it silently, mm. but then we had a reflection after it. Um, anyhow, I don't have a question as much as just um, a testimony to the power of it, that we were utter strangers who had this experience together over you know, 25 minutes and, and it really opened everybody up and um, it was much more profound than I expected. So. Uh, thank you for that. I'm I'm excited that that's in my community. So and I get to go work there. So thank you. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. I created that labyrinth earlier this year, and it was um, with the head of the art department, uh, Cynthia. She uh, is a faculty member, and uh, they actually had money left over from unused COVID testing, and uh, they used that leftover money to create the health, you know. Uh, mental health and wellness for the students with the labyrinth, which I think was really cool. And then involve the students in the creation of it. So uh, yeah, it's colleges and universities are really, that's probably the the number one client I have right now is uh, college campuses for, for labyrinths. Peggy, yes, I have Michelle. a question. I have a question. I just am curious to know what's behind you because it looks like it's on a beach with rocks. Yeah. Um, and so I this is a wondered... labyrinth. Yeah, this is a labyrinth at UC Merced in uh, California, and um, it's a labyrinth made with decomposed granite and river rocks. And so the river rocks are about submerged about halfway into the DG, which is compacted down and made into a kind of hard surface. But it does have kind of like a sandy appearance, and um, it's kind of a semi-permeable labyrinth that's more permanent than just uh, stones on the ground with dirt or uh, mulch, but it's uh, it's not as a hard surface as a concrete. So it's kind of a medium level, medium budget design. Well, um, the labyrinths that, that we were talking about are all more or less permanent. And I just wondered, since I'm looking at what looked like a beach to me, whether, um, whether there's any history of a kind of ephemeral one where the on a beach or someplace where the water would wash it away. Yeah, there's a labyrinth maker in Oregon named Denny Dyke, and he has a group called Circles in the Sand, and he does labyrinths on the beach um, through the summer, and uh, they're just there for a couple hours. And hundreds of people come to the beach and walk his labyrinth, and then the tide washes it away. And so, um, there is something about the temporary labyrinth and uh, non-attachment and, you know, it's like Tibetan, like those sand uh, mandalas that are created where you create it just for a period of time and then they're washed away. It's kind of nice. Sure. Paul? Uh, my question is real. I mean, the labyrinths that I've walked 
have always been a singular individual moment, but you get a large group, maybe with a cohort where some are going in and some are going out and passing each other. And there's always, I found it awkward when you're passing someone coming out as you're going in. What's your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, it is a surprise to people because the labyrinth is really like a narrow pathway for like a shoulder width. And once you make it to the center and turn around again, then it becomes a two-way street and people are unsure what to do. And we don't prescribe that. We don't tell people what to do when we facilitate a walk because really we want them to navigate that and come up with their own, you know, uh, approach to the walk. And some people make room for the other person. Some people, you know, wait for the other person to make space for them. Some people wait at a turn and you can, you know, if you stand at a turn, you can let someone go by. And if you're going faster than somebody else, then you can just turn in front of them and kind of shortcut the turn. And we do tell people to honor their own pace. So you don't have to walk the labyrinth slowly and you don't have to stand in line if someone is, you know, you know, you don't want everybody to line up behind a slow person. So it's okay to pass people and it's okay to let people pass you. But whether you're the person that steps aside or stays on the path or waits for somebody, it's really up to you because we don't want to prescribe the metaphor. You know, it's like really you need to have your own experience so you can have your own insights about what that reflects in your own life and use that two way interaction to think like, how do I how do I navigate that in, in the real world? You know, do I see people as obstacles? Do I see them as you know, other people in different parts of the path? Do I see them as strangers, as friends? You know, maybe if you're a person that always lets people by, you might be go on a walk where you try to stay on the path and let other people's walk, you know, out of their way for you. Or if you're a person that always stays on the path, maybe it would be a practice to let other people go by and step off the path. So it is a kind of a dance. And if you don't like it, there is the one-way processional labyrinth, you know, where you can have a single pathway. Um, like we've done labyrinths at mental health uh, centers. And then, you know, to so people don't have to be confronted with other people, then that's where the Baltic wheel or a processional labyrinth would be a better choice, where it's just a one-way path. And like this labyrinth in, in UC Merced has a three-foot wide pathway. So this has a very large pathway which allows for people to pass each other without having to step off the pathway. Ryan. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. So most of the examples and when most people think of labyrinth, they think of the big thing on the floor um, that you walk through, but in your examples, you had showed, um, I think you showed a finger labyrinth where you kind of trace it with your finger. And there was another one that I saw, which looked really interesting. It looked like it had text, like you kind of read the text as you go mm -hmm. around the labyrinth. And so I'm curious, have you seen anybody taking these versions of labyrinths and maybe using them in spaces where you don't have the big floor plan, but you know maybe there's some space off to the side where you could dedicate kind of this sort of a thing to and have something on the wall or a tape, a small table or something, you know, are people using it in these kind of other ways rather than just the big floor plan way? Um, mostly the handheld labyrinths are what people use at home. So like you purchase a handheld labyrinth and it's like on a board or a piece of plastic or something or um, ceramics and you, you hold the labyrinth and you trace it with your finger. It's rare that there's a handheld labyrinth that's like uh, embedded into a space, although there are a few like in, in Italy, there's a church that has a finger labyrinth at the entrance. So you walk like through the door of the church and there's a labyrinth that you could trace with your finger before you entered the church. Um, but that's interesting concept to actually have a permanent finger labyrinth that's fixed into a space and uh, I haven't seen that very much. I think that that's a real possibility for, for exploration because labyrinths do take up space and sometimes churches don't have the space or the budget. And um, yeah, maybe a finger labyrinth would be a, a nice thing to have there. And it also functions 
visually as well, because, you know, some people just like to look at the labyrinth and just to have the labyrinth on the wall, you know, can be a compelling thing. I've, I've heard a story of someone in a cancer treatment center looking out their window and just seeing the labyrinth out their window in the courtyard was was healing for them just to look at the design. And like we saw, Native Americans use it for jewelry and basketry. So I think, yeah, there is a lot of opportunity there for for exploration of of using the labyrinth and the aesthetic, and then also a, kind of a, a handheld way in a permanent way. I have I haven't seen that much though. And finger labyrinths are are a good way to introduce labyrinths to people as well. So uh, during the pandemic, when we couldn't be together, we started tracing handheld labyrinths on Zoom, and we do these uh, Friday finger walks. So if you want to uh, kind of experience the labyrinth uh, as a group, every Friday, Veritas hopes, hosts a free Zoom session where people trace a labyrinth with their finger and there's music and there's a theme and then there's an opportunity to share your experience with other people. And, um, and uh, I've heard of congregations, you know, if you're trying to raise awareness of the labyrinth, um, you could photocopy a paper labyrinth and then you could pass out the paper labyrinths to everybody. And then people in the church could trace the labyrinth with their finger um, as part of a service or something, or they could take that finger labyrinth home with them on a piece of paper. So it is a kind of a nice way to introduce the labyrinth experience to people. We are about at the end of our time. Thank you so much, Lars. This was really a great talk. It's different than um, than anything we've heard before. <laughs> Great. Well, it's fun. Yeah, labyrinths are interesting and they're really open to uh, to interpretation. So I welcome you to, uh, you know, to take it and run with it and create your own uh, own labyrinth of whatever, you know, material or size or design. And uh, it helps to go back and look at the history of the design to understand, you know, what works, what doesn't work and kind of honor that. But then you, there's a lot of room, you know, in the future to develop new ways of, of experiencing the labyrinth. So. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you.